Before we move on to the next question, I'd like to take this opportunity to clear up a misconception by a certain Wikipedia vandal trying to muddy the waters. I honestly shouldn't even bother with this vandal. As demonstrated by his site, he is not interested in the truth, but rather creating pages attacking people. He does not even have the common decency to use dignified photographs of his perceived enemies, and his site contains nothing but word games and mischaracterizations of what was said. But, because it is related to the last question, I feel the need to address it. Firstly, let's recap what this is all about. There are two types of solar flares, solar proton events and solar x-ray events. As their name suggests, one delivers protons and one delivers x-rays. Either way, both are a hazard. As James Van Hoften and company tell us, the biological effects of x-rays are similar to proton events. The solar flares discussed in astronautical engineering and science are proton flares, three minor, one mild and one major. The major flares, discussed in Noah's Comprehensive Flare Index, are X-ray flares. Now there are two versions of the CFI. One lists these flares by date, the other lists them by importance or significance. In other words, from the most hazardous flares to the least hazardous flares. During a debate on the Internet Movie Database Forum, I pointed out that one of the major flares from Apollo 13 is higher up on this list than one of the major flares from August 1972, i.e. one of the flares that no one denies would have killed an astronaut if they were out in cislunar space during this time. In response, the Vandal claims to have found the August 22, 1958 flare among the CFI. On this he writes, The August 1958 flare has an importance of 15 and a brightness of 3. Statistically, it is considered a more probable candidate for being a proton event than the August 1972 and the Apollo 13 flares. However, White's own schema from Astronautical Engineering and Science demonstrates that the 1958 flare is readily attenuated by shielding that is commensurate to the CM shielding. While White places great emphasis on the 1970 and 1972 flares, highlighting them as proof of his claims, he has omitted the 1958 flare with its higher importance and brightness, possibly because it does not support his argument. This is a goldmine of misinformation and is extremely misleading. Firstly, as stated previously, the schema from Astronautical Engineering and Science discusses proton events and the CFI discusses X-ray events. Because Noah's data on proton events only goes back as far as 1976, he cannot prove that the August 22, 1958 X-ray flare and the August 22, 1958 proton flare are the same flare. All he's proven is that on August 22, 1958, there was one major X-ray flare and one minor proton flare. Secondly, his claim that the Apollo capsule could be shielded by this flare. As stated previously, the chart measures water shielding in grams per square centimeter. Further up on his page, the Vandal claims that the command module shielding was 7 to 8 grams per square centimeter. He evidently got these numbers from the Science at NASA article Sickening Solar Flares. We measure the shielding of our ships in units of aerial density, or grams per centimeter squared, says Cuchinota. Big numbers, which represent thick hulls, are better. The hull of an Apollo command module rated 7 to 8 grams per centimeter squared. A modern space shuttle has 10 to 11 grams per centimeter squared. The hull of the ISS, in its most heavily shielded areas, has 15 grams per centimeter squared. Future moon bases will have storm shelters made of polyethylene and aluminum, possibly exceeding 20 grams per centimeter squared. A typical spacesuit, meanwhile, has only 0.25 grams per centimeter squared, offering little protection. That's why you want to be indoors when the proton storm hits, says Cuchinota. Another thing that needs pointing out is that this 7 to 8 grams per square centimeter figure refers to the hull, not the entire capsule. The CM was a conical pressure vessel with a maximum diameter of 3.9 meters at its base and a height of 3.65 meters. 
It was made of an aluminium honeycomb sandwich bonded between sheet aluminium alloy. The base of the CM consisted of a heat shield made of brazed stainless steel honeycomb filled with a phenolic epoxy resin as an ablative material and varied in thickness from 1.8 to 6.9 centimeters. Essentially, the thick hulls functioned as a heat shield and was made from materials designed to burn away on re-entry. The CM walls were a thin aluminium honeycomb bonded together between aluminium sheets. These sheets were around 2 mm each and the honeycomb added another millimeter at most, bringing the total aluminium thickness to 5 mm. Multiplying this thickness by the aluminium's density gives us an aerial density of 1.35 grams per square centimeter for the CM walls. A good deal less than the 7 to 80 sites, wouldn't you say? And then, as a last resort, the Vandal goes on to claim that the ablated phenolic resin also acted as a radiation shield. Phenolic resin has a density of 1.1 grams per cubic centimeter, which is comparable to water. Doing the math indicates that the aft heat shield at its thickest point had an aerial density comparable to the 7 to 8 grams per square centimeter he cites. But, if we apply that same math to the ablative covering the rest of the hull, we find it only has an aerial density of about 2 grams per square centimeter. So while the aft heat shield's ablator may offer protection, the comparatively thinner ablative material covering the rest of the hull would only reduce the August 22nd flare's dose rate to around 25 rem per hour. Like the author said on the previous page, contrary to what might be expected, much of the radiation encountered in solar proton outbursts appears to reach the vicinity of the Earth in isotropic distribution, thus necessitating protection from all directions. In short, Apollo was not protected from all directions. But let's play along with his numbers and say the entire craft was rated at 8 grams per square centimetre. If we look back to the chart in Astronautical Engineering and Science, we find that a ship with a water shield of 8 grams per square centimetre would indeed reduce the dose from the August 22nd 1958 flare down to around 10 to the 0 gram per hour, or 1 gram per hour. That certainly seems to be safe for astronauts, but there are some problems. Namely, this chart demonstrates only the primary doses of radiation, not the secondary doses of radiation received from photons and secondary particles produced by the primary particles impacting with the shielding. It even says that two pages earlier. These curves consider primary radiation alone. Some estimates for the secondary problem for such flares have been made. An 8 gram per square centimetre shield may very well be able to bring the primary dose from the August 22nd 1958 flare down to 1 rem per hour, regardless of whether it was water or aluminium. But the advantage of water is the fact that it is effective at absorbing the secondary radiation. Aluminium is not, it only increases the risk of particle fragmentation. Thirdly, although the Wiki Vandal focuses heavily on the low energy flare of August 22nd, 1958, he ignores the low energy flares of May 10th and July 14th, 1959. The Astronautical Engineering and Science Schema clearly indicates that a hull with an aerial density of 8 grams per square centimeter would bring the dose down to around 10 cubed, or 1000 rem per hour and the shuttle shielding of 11 grams per square centimetre would only reduce the dose to somewhere above 100 rem per hour. In fact, you need a shield with an aerial density of 31 grams per square centimetre just to bring the dose down to around 25 rem per hour. That's more than double the aerial density of the shielding used on the ISS. To put that into perspective, you would need a water shield 31 centimetres thick or an aluminium shield about 11 and a half centimeters thick just to bring the primary doses of these minor flares down to 25 rem per hour. The hull on the command module was only about 3 centimeters thick. And remember, this is the dose received by primary radiation. The total dose delivered by both the primary radiation and the secondary radiation will be much higher. Fourthly, if we play along with the Vandal's game, 
assuming these minor proton events made it into Noah's list of major X-ray events, we find there was one major X-ray flare on May 10, 1959, and two major X-ray flares on July 14, 1959. One such flare has an importance of 16 and a brightness greater than 3. Looks like the Vandal's examination of the data was inconsistent. The Vandal makes similar remarks in one of his videos, but this time he wants specific calculations. Okay then. The outer Van Allen belts are predominantly composed of electrons with energies of 3 to 5 mega electron volts. A small proportion of the electrons do have higher energies. Strontium-90, which produces decay products that emit 2.3 mega electron volt beta particles, are readily shielded using low atomic number materials rated at approximately 0.5 grams per centimeter squared. What calculations have Hoax proponents conducted to determine the attenuation of the Van Allen electrons for the command module that is rated at 7 to 8 grams per centimeter squared? Sorry, but electrons in the outer Van Allen belt average between 10 to 100 mega electron volts, not 3 to 5. And as we've already seen, the 7 to 8 grams per square centimeter rating he gives for the CM applies only to the thicker portion of the heat shield. Now, the inner belts are a different story. Electrons there average between 1 to 5 mega electron volts. Taking the lesser end of this range, it's possible to stop 1 MeV electrons with just over 0.5 grams per centimetre squared of material. The authors of Astronautical Engineering and Science discuss this. They write, The thickness of shielding needed for stopping electrons in the Van Allen belts is seen to be quite small, with the maximum path length for 1 MeV electron in aluminium being 0.545 grams per square centimetre. Stopping 10 to 100 MeV electrons in the outer belt would obviously require more shielding than this. But let's play along with his numbers and say the outer belt contains only 3 MeV electrons. Bringing these to a stop will require a bit over 1.5 grams per square centimetre. But even though you've stopped them, your problems are not over. As electrons are brought to a halt, they lose energy and this is given off as the Bremsstrahlung radiation. That is, as secondary X-ray photons which require further shielding. So how much radiation will be generated? Well, this gets complicated, but since he asked for it, here goes. The authors tell us that the fraction of energy given off as Bremsstrahlung will be given by the formula F equals KZE where K is 7 by 10 to the minus 4, and Z is the atomic number, which for aluminium is 13. Multiplying these out tells us that photons with energies of 27.3 kilo electron volts will be generated. This puts them in the category of what are called hard X-rays, which can penetrate solid objects, such as people. Converting this to joules tells us that each photon has 4.37 by 10 to the minus 15 joules. James Van Allen stated that the electron flux in the outer belt was 40,000 particles per square centimetre per second. This works out to 1.44 by 10 to the 12 electrons per square metre per hour, each of which will be converted to X-ray photons. An average adult human has a front surface area of 0.85 square meters. This means they'd be hit by 1.22 by 10 to the 12 photons per second. Multiplying this by the energy of each photon means they will receive 5.35 millijoules per hour of x-rays. To convert this to grey radiation units, we need to multiply that by the body mass of an adult, which averages 75 kilograms. This gives us 0.401 gray per hour. To convert this to rems per hour, we multiply by 100 and get 40 rems per hour. That's what you'll get from 3 MeV electrons. Now applying this calculation to the actual electron energies for the outer belt gives us 136 rems per hour for the 10 MeV electrons and 1,360 rems per hour for the 100 MeV electrons. 
and that assumes you've got 5 to 55 grams per square centimeter of aluminium to stop them, which you obviously don't. The x-rays they generate are obviously going to require even more shielding, 